Immediately after the First World War, the British colonial forces in eastern Nigeria defeated the last major resistance to colonial rule. This was the Ekumeku Rebellion. In the following decade, however, resistance to colonial rule continued. But the people of Africa would change their tactics and women played a vital role in a renewed anti-colonial struggle. The women's protests of 1929 marked the climax in women's resistance to colonial rule in eastern Nigeria. The protests began in the rural town of Ahaba Oloko when Igbo women suspected the colonial government's intention to use warrant chiefs and the native court system to implement a new tax on women, which they believed the colonial government planned to add to an existing tax on African men. From the initial outbreak of resistance in Oloko, the women's protests would extend across eastern Nigeria. Women joined the movement and demanded significant policy changes or the removal of the colonial government. Thousands of women would participate in the protest. The women employed a variety of tactics, which included removing the cap of office from warrant chiefs, locking factories, burning down native court buildings, blocking train tracks, cutting telegraph wires, releasing prisoners from colonial jails, and destroying or confiscating colonial property. The British colonial government is forced to deploy lethal force, and in the process, colonial soldiers shot at women at Abak, Utuetimekbo, and Opobo. The most significant loss of life occurred at Opobo, and it marked the end of the women's protest except for a few minor instances of resistance. Hello, 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 His Plus. Welcome to His Pool Media. Gabriel here. If you are new here, consider subscribing to this channel and book the like button on this video. Thank you. There is a long history of collective action by women in Nigeria. In the 1910s, women in Abaja stayed away from their homes for one month because they thought that their men were killing pregnant women. Their collective absence pushed village elders to take action in 1924. Diverse views have been offered to explain the causes of the women's protest. For the purpose of this video, I will try to group the causes into remote and direct cause. First, the women's protest was precipitated in part by the global depression. The protest occurred when the income women derived from palm produce dropped, while the cost of the imported goods sold in their local market rose sharply. For example, from December 28, 1928 to December 29, 1929, the prices of palm oil and candle in Aba fell by 17% and 21% respectively, while the duties on imported foodstuffs or goods like tobacco, cigarettes, and grey bath increased by 33% and 100% respectively. Another remote cause of the protest is rooted in the political transformation resulting from the British indirect rule policy. The women's protest stemmed from the military occupation of the Igbo area by the British in early 1900s and the Warren chiefs they appointed to administer the various communities. The women were particularly upset by the deserialization of laws and during the protest they called for the restoration of the old order. On the other hand, the British appointed warrant chiefs also abused their offices to enrich themselves. This was in part because they were paid meager allowances that could not sustain their newly acquired prestige and lifestyles. Virtually all of them established a private court in their compounds where they settled disputes. They also used headmen to collect fines and levies, thus alienating members of their community. Similarly, the warrant chiefs performed executive functions for the colonial government. This included overseeing the employment of forced labor, a duty that made them unpopular in the eyes of the people. During the protest, the women complained about forced labor, claiming it increased their workload by depriving them of the services they usually received from their husbands in farming and the production of palm produce. Women were also concerned about the emerging urban centers, which had become hubs for those engaged in prostitution and other vices that the women believe polluted the land. The direct cause of the protest, however, was direct taxation. The British colonial administration had taken measures to enforce the Native Revenue Ordinance in April 1929. 
the then lieutenant governor of Nigeria, had consigned a colonial residence, W.E. Hunt, to bring an understanding of the objectives and provisions of the new ordinance through explanation to the people of the five provinces in the eastern region. This strategy was used to make clear the path for the direct transaction whose date of arrival was April 1928. However, in September 1929, Captain J. Cook was delegated to take over duties of the Bende Division temporarily from the serving officer, Mr. Ware, until the return of Captain Hill from leave. And within few weeks of control, Captain Cook would consider the already established tag rules insufficient because they did not include details of the number of wives, children, and livestock in each household. He decided to revise the existing rule. This unreasonable and vexatious action of Captain Cook triggered the two-month fire of the Aba women's protest. The village of Inchara shares boundaries with the Ingwa people of Abia state on its northwest and the Anangs of Akwaibom state on its southern part. It was from this community that a group of women, led by very courageous Ikona Nwanyuku Enya, confronted their Waran chief, Okeogu, who dared to enforce the obnoxious law by the colonial masters that women should start paying thugs like their husbands. That act of valor by Madame Ikona and her colleagues continued to wear the wrong toga about women's riots when the scene of action was never in Aba. Madame Ikona Born in 1877 into the family of Mazioji Nwama from Oloko village, but married to the family of Enya Ndiopolo Akano Achara in Oloko clan of the old Bende division of what is now known as Abia state. A very beautiful woman in her youth, Ikona was said to have been so loved by the father that he gave her the name Ikona. Again, her beauty, strength, and fearlessness became for her as a young girl sources of disadvantage because her parents believed that the white man's education was only for lazy male children and because her no-nonsense attitude could get her into trouble and may result in her being sold into slavery. She was never allowed to acquire what she would later label the white man's staff, Western education. Be that as it may, Ikona's educational disadvantage did not prevent her from getting married to Mazi Enya Mbodu of Umu Okengwebe, both in Incharaoloko in Ekuano Umuahia area of now Abia State. The marriage was blessed with four children, a girl and three boys. As a young woman, Ikona had both the leadership qualities and militant disposition to organize the women of Incharaoloko clan for positive action against societal ills. So, in 1929, when Chief Okeogu, the Warren chief of Oloko, broke the sad news that women should begin paying tax in accordance with the wishes of the colonial masters. Ikona mobilized the women folk to confront the authorities. She went beyond her immediate Nchara community to Umugo, Ahaba, Usaka, Eleogu, Azuyi, Obohia, Amizi, and Owomoku, all neighboring communities within a local clan, to mobilize women for a protest march against the tax law. The protest was said to have taken the women to the residence of the district head, Captain Hill. Here, Ikona and her protesting colleagues had a brush with the guard, Kotima, who they subdued. The women were in nudity, except for the local Akko relief they used in covering their womanhood. At Chief Okeogu's house, Ikona was said to have personally charged at the man, pushing him around and removing his cap. Before this time, Records has it that on the morning of 18 November 1929, a man named Mark Umerua, who was conducting census in relation to taxation on the people living in the village of Oloko, upon the instruction of the Warren chief Okeogu, entered the compound of a widow named Uwanyoku and instructed her to count her livestock and people living with her. Knowing fully well what this meant, it would be taxed based on the number of outcomes, Uwanyoku became embittered. In replying, she said, was your widow mother counted? This simply means that women were not supposed to pay tax in Igbo society. Anger was however expressed with words by the two of them. Thus, the widow proceeded to the town square to find other women who were already deliberating on the tax issue and explained to them her sad experience. 
On one Yoko account prompted the women to invite other women with the aid of palm leaves from other areas of the Bende district. About 10,000 women gathered and a protestation insisting on the removal and trial of the Warren chief was staged. Fearing that the situation might get out of hand, especially as the protest spread to Umuahia, where factories and government offices were located, the British district officer acceded to the women's demands and jailed Okeogu for two years. Generally, the protest in Bende Division ended peacefully, and the district officer effectively used the leaders of the women to curtail future protests. In another development, in a bad division of Oweri province, the women protests, however, took on a more violent tone. It was from there that the protests spread to parts of Oweri, Ikorekpende, and Abak divisions. The protest began in Owerinta after the enumerator of the Warren chief Njoku Alaribe knocked down a pregnant woman during a scuffle, leading to the eventual termination of her pregnancy. The news of her assault shocked local women who on December 9, 1929, protested against what they regarded as an act of abomination. The masses in Njoku's compound and during an encounter with armed police, two women were killed and many others were wounded. Their leader was whisked off to the city of Abba where she was detained in prison. Owerinta women then summoned a general assembly of all Ngwa women at Ekeopara on December 11, 1929 to recount their sad experiences. The meeting attracted thousands of women, including those from neighboring Igbo areas. They resolved to carry their protest to Abba. As the women arrived on Factory Road in Abba, a British medical officer driving accidentally injured two of the women, who eventually died in the clinic. The other women in anger raided the nearby Barclays Bank and the prison to release their leaders. They also destroyed the native court building, European factories, and other establishments. No one knows how many women died in Abba, but according to oral compilation of women participation in the protest, about 100 women were killed by soldiers and policemen. The protest then spread to Ikorekpende and Abak divisions of Calabar province, taking a violent and deadly turn at Otu Etimeko, where government buildings were burned on December 14 and a factory was looted, leaving some 18 women dead and 19 wounded. More casualties were recorded at Ikorabasi near Opobo, also in Calabar province, where on December 16, 31 women and one man were reportedly killed and 30 others wounded. On January 2, 1930, the government appointed a commission of inquiry to investigate the root cause of the disturbances in Calabar province. The commission submitted a short report on January 27, 1930, but due to the report's limited scope, the government appointed a second commission on February 7, 1930 to cover Oweri and Calabar provinces. The commission began its work at Aba on March 10, 1930 and submitted its report on July 21. The report convinced the government to carry out many administrative reforms including the abolition of Warren chief system, the rapid pace of social change, and allay the fears that women would not be taxed. For more stories on the colonial era in Nigeria, please click here. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel and enable notification for more videos, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.